Let me read it for us now. Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them, male and female. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't think I'd surprise anyone if I said to them that our world is currently in a little bit of a flutter about sex and gender and everything in between. Uh, We're more than aware of the debate about gender and how we express this in our world. We experience it in everything from the nature and use of pronouns through to the revamped application forms for weekend sport. It's part of our entertainment cycle through to the way we manage our social media profiles. I was told this week that there are more than 100 gender options on TikTok. The debate is now part of our health system, our education system, even central to the way our major industrial companies market themselves and do business. It's one of the easiest sermons to kick off with because you really don't have to come up with an example, do you? We're all aware of what's going on. As God's people, I think we need to think very clearly about this debate and about the terms of the debate itself. Uh, This is a short series, only four weeks. Patricia Wirakun is coming in the middle, and I want this to stimulate our thoughts along biblical lines, even in such a debated arena. Uh, In four sermons, we're going to look at man and woman, male and female today, Uh, marriage next week, Dan's then going to help us look at singleness the week after, and then we're going to finish with children. Are we going to cover every question? Probably not in four weeks. Will we cover every angle? Probably not in four weeks. Will we start to see what God's word says? I really hope so. So let's pray together and then dive into God's word. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you that it is clear. I thank you that you speak. Uh, Your speaking is not just a guidebook Uh, a manual, an instruction book. Your speaking is the revelation of your nature and so an understanding of your design and creation and a revealing of your goodness. Father, please bring all those things to our hearts and minds today as we look at your design in your world. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I think part of uh, this debate is getting our terms clear. One of the things we talked about at Bible study, about point two on the outline is uh, we're a people of words, aren't we? Uh, We're a word people, not just because we read God's word or we're saved by God's word in the flesh, but we we use words in community, don't we? That's how we relate, how we communicate, how we socially interact, how we define a whole lot of stuff. Words are really important. And behind our words is always a perspective or a framework No one comes to this arena without a perspective. No one is neutral. Everyone has a perspective. So it's helpful to outline our perspective before we get in. I want to do that with just five quick ideas, and then we're going to define two words. Before we do, let me take you to a book that I found very helpful. Uh, We get a new bookstore this week, and this is a book that I found really, really instructive. Uh, embodied transgender identities, the church, and what the Bible has to say. Uh, the author has got the best name in all of Christian publishing, Preston Sprinkle. I think that's a corker. I just think that's great. So I'm going to be talking about Mr. Sprinkle during the service, okay? So don't laugh each time I say it. But he has just put together, I think, one of the most helpful books. Uh, he has done all the hard work for us. Uh, he's a professor of theology in America. And he has dived into all the areas of the debate and put it together. He's got a companion book 
and it came out a little bit before this one. Uh, the companion book is called People to be Loved, Why Homosexuality is Not Just an Issue. And when you read those two books together, I think you'll come to a very helpful understanding of what God's Word has to say. There are going to be five copies of each on our bookstall from next week. Uh, let's actually just begin with the five planks that we need to have as Christians. I'm going to move through these quickly because none of these will be a surprise. First, God made the world. God made all humans in his image and he made it very good. That's one of the great things that we heard in the kids' talk. God made the world. All humans are in his image. He made it very good. Second, human sin has broken the world. Human sin has broken the world we live in. It's broken us, and it's not just broken us, it's broken the way we think about the world. Thirdly, God's not abandoned his world. God loves it. God sent his own son, Jesus Christ, in the flesh to deal with the world's brokenness. Jesus did that in his life, death, and resurrection. We spent time in that earlier this year, didn't we? Looking at us being a gospeling people. That's the message we're taking to the world. Fourthly, all creation will be renewed one day. It will be ruled by Jesus in a new creation that is greater than the first. That means our world is moving somewhere. Creation will be renewed ruled by Jesus, and it will be greater. Last plank, how do we know all this? God speaks, doesn't he? God speaks to us in his word and, most importantly, in his son. Those are the five planks. Let me just go through them very quickly. God made the world, all humans in his image, very good. Human sin broke the world, broke us and the way we understand the world. God loves the world. He's not abandoned it. He sent his son to fix it up. All creation will be renewed and ruled by Jesus and it will be greater. And we know this from God's word. That's our perspective. But with that perspective, let's define two key words. You'll see them there. They're the two key words at the heart of so much that goes on. Sex and gender. Sex and gender. We had a great discussion about this in our Bible study group the other night. Uh, We broke up into into small groups and we had to come up with a definition of it in our groups, in our Bible study. And it's part of the debate we're in. So let's look at these two terms as the world understands it. When, When we're talking about sex, we're not talking of the act, we're talking of the biology. And we've got to recognize that our understanding of sex as biology comes from the reality of reproduction. Humans are, and we're going to use some funky terms here, humans are what you call dimorphic. Dimorphic. That means reproduction happens when two gametes come together, an egg and sperm, from two different kinds of humans. And those humans are defined by their role in that process. That's what we're talking about when we come to sex. Male, female, man, woman. They're distinguished by their physical, internal and external features. And those features are involved in reproduction. They're connected with hormones, which are connected with their physical attributes And that's all connected with chromosomes. Males have an XY and females have an XX. So here's your summary. Okay, here's your summary. It's a biological category, male or female. Presence or absence of Y chromosome. Internal reproductive organs, external anatomy, secondary characteristics. Uh, Listen to what Sprinkle says. It's widely accepted among scientists and scholars and anyone you'd want operating on you in emergency. This is basic biology. And you won't find any other definition 
in textbooks. So that's what we're dealing with when we talk about sex. Gender is something else, isn't it? And Sprinkle says this, conversations about gender are the wild, wild west of scholarly debate. Put simply, this is the most widely accepted definition. Gender is the psychological, social and cultural aspects of being male or female. Let me say that again. The psychological, social and cultural aspects of being male or female. That breaks down into two parts, gender roles and gender identity. Gender roles have to do with how males and females are expected to act in any given culture. We've got another word for that, haven't we? That's stereotypes. Okay, stereotypes. Stereotypes are good. Okay, they, they're generalised statements about what generally happens. Okay, that's what a stereotype is. And there's a lot of debate about whether they come about through nature or nurture. Okay, uh, nurture, did you know that in the early 1900s, Pink was the colour recommended for boys and blue was the colour recommended for girls. Pink because it was vibrant and out there, blue because it was delicate and dainty. Is is that the way we think about it today? So that's an aspect of nurture, the way the culture affects you. Nature, well, let me just pick something connected with my sex. All baby boys get a bath in testosterone at a certain point, don't they? And that affects them in a certain way. That's nature. So gender roles are a product of both, nature and nurture. Gender identity, though, that's something very different again. That's the way one's internal sense of self as male or female is understood, or in our world, male, female, both or neither. It is really debated across all of the spectrums of academia and theology, not just whether it exists. So there's even a debate about whether there's such a concept, but also how you work out what it is and even if you can change it. Sex and gender, two words we've got to get a grip on if we're going to think about this debate in a kind, truthful and gentle way. Now, I know I've spent a lot of time with those words, but they are worth getting straight, aren't they? Because everywhere you look in this debate, they're discussed and we need to think about them. So let's turn to God's word. Let's turn to what God has to say as he speaks to us about his design. I want to do this with six statements. I'm at point three on the outline. I'll bring the statements up and then the Bible passages. Uh, Let me say this is chapter three in Preston Sprinkle's book. Uh, It it was so good. So this is nothing original from me. Uh, This is where I'm using his work because he's done such good work. So let's work through it together and let's see his six statements. Statement number one. The body is essential to image bearing. Listen to what God's word said. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They'll rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them, male and female. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the ground. Now, there's a lot in those verses, isn't there? Even pronouns, which is a matter of debate. And notice how it uses pronouns differently to what we'd expect. One God with a plural pronoun. But the heart of it turns on what the word image means. Kids, you already heard about image in your kids' talk, didn't you? And it was terrific that Mary encouraged us to think about that. What does this word mean? Uh, We're going to come to what that unpacks in a moment, but in the Hebrew, it's the word selim. Now, I'm no Hebrew scholar. I was too lazy to take Hebrew at Bible college. 
Uh, there was a, a dummies course for three weeks. I took that one. So I'm really thankful for Preston Sprinkle here. But the word is selim, T-S-E-L-E-M. It's used 17 times in the Old Testament. Ten times it's used to describe something that is carved as an image, something physical, something that represents a god or something else. Two times it's then explicitly applied to humans and then five times it's used like this in Genesis. So putting all that together, when Genesis is written, image means humans are physically representing God. The body matters. It's a physical representation of who God is and it's connected to his design. And I want you to notice something very clear here. I want you to notice that it describes both a male and a female and their bodies. Put all that together, the human body, the male and the female body, are essential to bearing the image of God. The body matters. And that means our definition of sex matters. Humans are a physical, bodily, visible reality about who God is and they're described as male and female. That's statement number one. Statement number two, male and female are categories of sex, not gender. Now we'll come to gender in a moment, but I want us to notice what was said there in Genesis Notice that as soon as God blessed them in verse 28, what does he tell them to go and do? Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Remember our definition of sex? It's connected with what? Reproduction. And so whatever else you want to say, it doesn't make any sense if we say these are social constructs that we've made up (laughs) because social constructs aren't going to reproduce, are they? Physical bodies will. That's played out in the rest of Genesis as we get the names for male and female. Male, Zakar, female, Nechabah. And every time those words are used, it's talking about reproduction. Male and female is a category of sex, not gender. The sex leads to our understanding of gender, not vice versa. And that is very important, as we'll see later on. Sprinkle quotes an Old Testament scholar called Phyllis Bird. Now, I don't think Phyllis is in our theological camp. She's an ordained elder in the liberal United Methodist Church of America. But she says this, Biological sex is the essential fact to define a human. Biological sex is the essential fact to define a human. So that's statements one. Statement two, let's go to statement three. Bodies are sacred. In Genesis 2, we move into a kind of street-level look at creation. Genesis 1 is kind of like you're flying a drone. You see it all from up high, see the days. But Genesis 2, you hop down like Google Maps and you walk down the streets and you, oh, look, there's man and woman being made. And it's really important to listen to what God says in verses 21 and 22. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he'd taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. Again, language is crucial. See the word that I've highlighted? The word rib. It's the Hebrew word cella, T-S-E-L-A. Again, I'm relying on the work of others. And that word occurs 40 times in the Old Testament. This is the only time it's translated rib. Every other time, it refers to a wall in a sacred building. Ezekiel 41, nine times it's used to describe various rooms in the new temple. This is the only time it's translated as rib. Really, it should be God took a side from the sacred building and made a woman. The implication's clear, isn't it? What's the body? 
Well, the body is a religious structure. The body is a building set apart by God and for God. It is unique in all of creation. Preston Sprinkle describes the human body as sacred architecture connected with representing not only the image of God but the dwelling of God. The body matters. Statement number four. Jesus sees Genesis 1 and 2 as normative. Uh, Dan came up to me after last week's sermon and said, Bernard, you've actually covered the next three weeks in one sermon. What are we going to do? I said, we'll just keep turning back to God's word. But it was a good point because when you get to Matthew chapter 19, which we looked at last week, and Jesus is asked that really curly question, where does he go? Can you remember? He goes way back to Genesis 1 and 2. Haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. And he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. The two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. Jesus is saying very clearly, God's design is this. Male, female. Bodily truths that serve a certain purpose in his world. For Jesus, God's design is normal and it defines everything else. It sets the pattern. It's no surprise, statement number five, that the Apostle Paul follows. Paul sees the body as central for self and moral decisions. Paul's just following the lead of Jesus, isn't he? And when Paul has to deal with what we do with the body and how important that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, this is what he says. Flee from sexual immorality. Every sin a person can commit is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. For you're bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Do you see what Paul is doing there? Your body defines you. And you are defined by your body. See how he interchanges the two in yellow? It's not the first time he does that. He also does it in Romans. In Romans chapter 6, verse 13 and 16, he says, give yourselves to God. Romans chapter 12, he says, give your body. Your body is you, and you are your body. Sprinkle says, Paul didn't think that what we do with our bodies is morally neutral. Personhood is a body. We're not souls with bodies. We're embodied souls. What you do with your body matters because your body is you. And we've just seen how God designed the body. Uh, Let's finish off with statement number six. Jesus' incarnation and resurrection affirms sexed embodiment. Whatever else you want to say about the incarnation and resurrection, there's a lot of debate about that. But in the flesh, Jesus has whose image? God's image. If Jesus didn't come as a human being who was a male, he couldn't bear the image of God, could he? because that was God's design in Genesis 1 and 2. And we see that in the New Testament in places like Colossians 1.15. He's the image, exactly the same word, the image of the invisible God. He's truly human, firstborn over all creation. Colossians 2 verse 9, for in him the entire fullness of God's nature dwells what? Bodily. When Jesus comes in the flesh and is raised in the flesh, God is saying, this is my design. The body matters. The body, your sex, represents me. So before I finish by thinking about what this might look like tomorrow morning, let me just quickly summarise where we've been in our statements. The body is essential to image bearing. Male and female are categories of sex, not gender. Bodies are sacred. Genesis 1 and 2 is normative for Jesus. 
Paul sees the body as central for who you are and your moral decisions. Jesus' incarnation and resurrection affirms this. So what's it going to look like on Monday morning? When someone says to you tomorrow at work, what did you talk about at church yesterday? Is that a grenade? How are you going to communicate it? Let me make a number of suggestions. First, personhood and identity is tied to sex, who we are as male and female. That is crucial for understanding gender, and it moves that way. This is who we've been made in the image of God with a body that is male or female that represents him. That is God's design, and that is critical, crucial, inseparable to bearing his image, male and female in the body. If we lose that, we compromise bearing the image of God. If we compromise on that, we compromise on Jesus. And if we compromise on him, we lose forgiveness of sins and all hope for eternity. Do you see how the dominoes fall out? Second, every human is made in God's image. Every human is made in God's image. That is foundational for us interacting with people who are like us and people who will disagree with us. While Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came as guests to eat with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Who did Jesus have dinner with? tax collectors and sinners. Who does Jesus come to deal with? Tax collectors and sinners. One of the great rebukes for me in Preston Sprinkle's writing has been, do you have dinner with those kinds of people, Bernard? I never thought that I would use an advertising slogan from Coles in a sermon. But this is my third point. Coles, earlier on this year, had an advertising slogan. You can guess which cultural event it was connected with. Everyone is welcome at our table. It's a good slogan, isn't it? It's actually a slogan that I think the people of God should grab. Because do you notice that it actually confronts us at the various spectrums of our age groups. For people who are a little older, I'm putting myself in that category. I finally said it in public. For people who are a little bit older, who've grown up with views on sex, perhaps connected with gender in a way that is tied inseparably, who are slightly confused by the world we live in today, who, I must admit, have had certain prejudice against people, perhaps I need to get a little closer to the dinner table with Jesus. And perhaps I need to rethink who I invite to the dinner table and who I'm willing to sit down with. For those who are a little younger, and I was so thankful for our Bible study group on Tuesday for this, and this application comes straight from our Bible study group. For those who are a little younger, they've been swimming in this water for a long time, haven't they? in social media, in schools and in education. And for them, the whole concept of choosing pronouns is just part of the water they swim in. That's understandable. Perhaps they need to think about how they manage who's at the dinner table and how they talk to them. Because this is very important when it comes to Jesus. Jesus has dinner with tax collectors and sinners and then in the very same verse he says, you guys need a doctor. Do you notice that he can eat with them without compromising God's design? 
In fact, when he eats with him, he does so so he can bring God's design to the table and say, you guys need to meet God. When he heard this, Jesus said, those who are well don't need a doctor, but the sick do. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus sits with these people. He sups with these people. He socialises with these people, these sinners and tax collectors, and then he says, you need God. Isn't that a helpful role model and a helpful mission? Because they're all made in whose image? God's image. Fourth point. Perhaps we need to work harder at not just understanding words, defining words, but hearing words. I am a great talker. I've even been known to talk over people. A former minister at Lightning Ridge and at Mungadai said, Bernard, God gave you two ears and one mouth. Listen twice as much. I think that's something we as Christians need to do better in this debate. And that's part of sitting at the dinner table, isn't it? Listening before we speak. Listening to God's word, firstly, but then listening to the others who might have a different view so that we can sup with them and talk to them about God's original design and who Jesus is. Hopefully, Part of this series will be encouraging us to do that in a kind and gentle way. Let me pray, and then I might ask for questions. Dear God, thanks for your word. Uh, Father, it's been a, a funny kind of time in your word. We've jumped all over it, and we've dived into a book by a brother who's written extensively on this topic. But, Father, thank you that we hear you speak uh, about your design and your desire and your purpose in sex and gender in male and female. Father, help us to hold on to this truth, to communicate it in grace and honesty and to live it in a way that points people to Jesus who sat and ate with tax collectors and sinners because they needed a doctor. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? All right, we got to, we'll go from the back first. So we'll go, we'll go Brent and then Roz and then Pete. Uh, this one, I'm coming to in later weeks. Uh, does Jeremy mean something to have in the race about something that I, I, I feel is quite clear cut? Is that something that we can take on board as well as father, as he? Like, how can there be a debate about this? And is, I guess, you know, like, what's the reason behind him saying there's a question there? And is there a clear answer? So Brent's asked a really important, I'm repeating it for the online stuff, Uh, Brent's asked a really important question. The Church of England is having a current debate at the moment. They have a lot of debates at the moment, let me me be very clear. And one of the debates is how we're going to refer to God, Uh, which fits in with the current debate at the moment in terms of personal pronouns and dealing with people about how they are comfortable. Um, Does that get the grip? Uh, Brent's asked a really good question. Let me make three points really quickly. Uh, Firstly, I'm so thankful that God is clear about his pronouns in his word. Isn't that the way we work in society? We ask the person we're talking to to set the pronouns. God's already done that. Uh, I think that's really helpful of God. Uh, We notice that in Genesis chapter 1. It's an our pronoun, isn't it? Uh, That means God is three in one, which is reflected in the two in one of marriage. So I think that's really helpful. In fact, universally throughout the Old and New Testament, God chooses a male personal pronoun, he, him. Uh, I think it would do us well to respect God's wishes at that point, which is exactly how we are being told to interact in society, isn't it? And so when we say that, we're actually not operating outside the norms of our current culture. We're actually just doing what our culture says, which is what God has always done. So I think that's the first point. I think the second point is uh, it's a reminder that language matters. God chooses to speak. He's not an illustrator. He speaks. He speaks, and that's connected with illustrations, with tangible representations. But God is a speaker, which means we are listeners. That is really important. 
Thirdly, uh, uh, a friend of mine noticed in a cancer ward that he was going to with one of his parents a sign behind the desk, what we permit, we promote, which was their way of dealing with people coming in saying, can you put these flyers on the desk? But it's a good phrase, isn't it? What we permit, we promote. And I think we're entering into dangerous ground here when we say to God, God, this is how you must be referred to, rather than us listening to God and God saying, this is who I am. Does that answer your question a bit, Brent? Terrific. Uh, Roz had a question here. Right now, today, why in Genesis 26 is it our? Yep. Why is it our and why is it our? Yeah. Really good one, and uh, I hope you picked up on that. God says in Genesis 26, let us make man in our image, let us create him in our likeness, and then uh, notice that it goes down into verse 27, God singular. Uh, I think we're being told something about the nature of God, which is individuals in community in one. And I think that's really important because when God makes humans, he makes them to be individuals in community in one. So God is three in one. We're two in one. And that is really important for the representation of God. And we see the flow and effect in terms of marriage, which we'll deal with next week. Is it the Trinity? No. Is it pointing to the Trinity? Definitely. I think we've got to just be careful there because the Jews had no understanding of the Trinity in the sense that it's finally revealed in its fullness in Jesus. And I think we've just got to hold that carefully there to see the process of God unfolding that for us. So that's how I... Does that answer your question, Roz? Yep. Pete? Um, you talk a lot about the body yep. and how important that is to us. And but that, in the Bible, we all about the flesh and how weak it is. Yeah. How can you have those? Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about this on my run yesterday with my knees. Um, uh, yeah, it's a really important point. Uh, how can we talk about the body being so central when the large parts of the Bible use the flesh as an image of our weakness? We've got to recognise that God's good creation in Genesis 1 and 2 is good. Bodies are good. In the rest of the Bible, the image of flesh is used as an expression for our brokenness because we feel our brokenness where? In our bodies. So don't lose Genesis 1 and 2. Your bodies are good, but your sin has broken them and broken the way they operate and in how you understand who you are. Yeah, does that make sense? Any last questions? Back to the last one. Um, if you say sex is important, then how come in the new heaven... I assume we'll have our sexes, but in the new heaven there's no marriage. Yeah. Why are you So one of the, the, the point I dropped out of, uh, so sex, ba- sex, Baxter, I'm mixing things up here, aren't I? Baxter has asked a question about sex, which is uh, why in the new heavens will we not have marriage if sex is so important? I think uh, two really important points. Do we take our biological sex into heaven? What was Jesus when he came back from the dead? He was male. What did he take into heaven? A male body. Okay. You'll be identifiably male and female in heaven. Okay. Do we need the physical signpost of marriage to point us to God in heaven? No, we don't, because who are we dwelling with? Oh, well, we look God in the face, don't we? And so we I think we maintain our sex in heaven. We're male and female. But we don't have marriage in heaven because we're face to face to the one marriage points to on earth, which is God. Does that answer your question? Terrific.